I'm Tiffany Pash. I'm a reporter with Vermont Digger. I cover education and we're here today with members of the Act 46 study committee from Roxbury and Mount Pelier. On June 20th, voters in their community will vote on whether to merge their school districts. There's a 17 mile distance between both town centers. Roxbury is rural and has about 86 students. Montpelier is more of a large city-like school district serving 992 equalized pupils in pre-K through grade 12. Roxbury's school is pre-K through 6 and then they tuition their high school students to other schools, mainly U32. If the merger passes, Roxbury will operate grades pre-K to 4, keeping their youngest children local, and send grades 5 to 12 students to Montpelier. There would be a nine-member school board with 16 votes. Seven members would be from Montpelier with two votes each, and two members from Roxbury with one vote each. If voters approve the merger, the school district would begin operating in July 2018. If you could each state your name and your affiliation. Sure. I'm John Guifre. I'm the Roxbury School Board Chair as well as the Chair of the Committee. I'm Jim Murphy. I'm on the Montpelier School Board and I was also on the Act 46 Study Committee. And I'm Tina Muncy. I'm on the Montpelier School Board and I was also on the Study Committee. Okay, I'm going to ask you all a series of questions. Um, would like each of you to take a moment to consider the question and answer it. The first one is, how did your study group arrive at this particular proposal? What type of data uh, did you consider? What type of issues came up? Sure. Well, I can start and then you guys can fill in. Uh, we began the process at the end of last year. We've had, I believe at this point, 14 um, publicly warned meetings with public comment session at all of them. Uh, back in the middle of March, when we mostly had the plan um, together, we, want, we held public information and feedback meetings in each community so that we could gather feedback from um, the constituents to see if there was anything that was glaring missing or needed to be changed. Um, and at that point, we continued to move forward. Uh, finished off the, the report and sent it to the Agency of Education for their um, approval or comment. And during that process, uh, we went back and forth uh, several times with our both administrations of both districts and supervisory unions, and maybe you might want to pick up on where I'm leaving off there as to what, what information we gathered. Yeah, I, I think we looked pretty comprehensively at a lot of information, uh, particularly as a Montpelier member. Uh, I wanted to know kind of what would be the cost to Montpelier. Would there be cost savings? You know, what if there were hidden costs, et cetera? Uh, so we asked the administrators of both school districts to uh, you know, build in what we thought were numbers that accounted for Kind of all the costs that could be expected plus you know what if what if we need to increase staffing in Roxbury uh, kind of the maximum type of transportation that would be needed to make sure that the Roxbury kids were able to participate in Montpelier schools uh, you know what would it cost to you know, feed kids in both districts etc uh, and we yeah you know, and got numbers that we felt uh, were you know very comprehensive and also very cautious in terms of making sure that we weren't uh, overlooking costs or coming up with numbers that perhaps were more optimistic than they should be or missed hidden costs etc uh, and came up with numbers that you know we thought justified the merger and and created savings for both both districts and then just kind of a quick bit of history as to how the merger came about uh, Roxbury approached us, and John might want to speak to this, you know, uh, um, either now or later. Uh, you know, Roxbury was in a situation where they really needed to merge. They needed to find a partner. Uh, under Act 46, their current system was unsustainable. Uh, uh, Montpelier was an attractive district for them. Um, and so, you know, we sat down. Montpelier was, you know, very interested in hearing how the, the merger might impact uh, Montpelier and might provide benefits for Montpelier. So uh, we sat down and again looked at a, a comprehensive suite of information in terms of getting to this. And what are some of those benefits? Uh, I think the primary benefits for Montpelier are that we add 86 students 
uh, and the more students we add, you know, right now Montpelier is one of two districts in the state that is actually gaining students. Uh, and that's been good, and it's been good for our budgets, because prior to that, there was a period where we were experiencing the same lulls as the rest of the state was. And it created some really tough budget decisions that we felt was creating educational issues for our kids. Uh, with kind of the last couple of years of increased enrollment, we've seen the benefits of that. Uh, but we all know where the state trends are. And while I think Montpelier uh, probably will enjoy a while more of increased enrollment, I think because it's an attractive community that is investing in education and people with kids are, are attracted to it as a result. I just think given the overall trends of, this, of, the, of where the state's going, having those additional kids and having that long-term stability, which will allow us to provide robust budgets without huge tax burdens, is an enormous benefit that the, the citizens of Montpelier really can't overlook and I think justifies the merger in and of itself. I also think Roxbury is a great community. I think it will add some diversity, as you mentioned. Uh, it's a more rural community. I think it will add some socioeconomic mix. I'm not quite sure I'd characterize Montpelier as a large city. Uh, <laughs> but it is certainly, I think, by Vermont standards, a more <laughs> urban community. Uh, and I think kids from both systems will benefit. And I think that families and, and parents will benefit, too, from, from having the diversity and having the mix. I think those are the two, two major benefits. There is also, as the numbers show, uh, a small tax benefit for the Montpelier residents. There's a substantial one for Roxbury. Uh, but there is a small savings, and a, a tax savings is a tax savings, especially when it gives you, I think, uh, a longer-term ability to continue to provide the type of budgets that will really get good educational results. Okay, and I am going to come back to you, Tina, with that question, but I wanted to ask you, why not Northfield? That's a very good question, and one we've been asked uh, quite a lot. Uh, as Jim alluded to, we, well, we, our fate was, uh, was sealed as soon as the act was passed two years ago, back in May of 2015. So we knew that we could not stay um, in the same situation that we were in. Our supervisory union, which was Northfield and Roxbury, I, I think is one of or the smallest supervisory union in the state. And we were too small to stay that way. So both communities needed to do something. That uh, launched us on a two-year journey through Act 46, um, where it culminated, uh, to make a long story short, it culminated with uh, two options for us, which were uh, to be a full member of a 706 study with Montpelier, uh, or to be an advisable member of the Northfield-Williamstown uh, merger study, which was going on at that point. That all came to being in the late summer of last year, early fall. Uh, we had had some preliminary discussions with uh, Montpelier school board members last summer um, as we sort of figured things out a little bit and uh, tested the waters. And uh, it culminated in a five and a half hour school board meeting in Roxbury where we needed as many people from our community to come in and give us the feedback on the the two paths that were available to us, which were the only two paths available to us. And uh, we needed some, some feedback loop from the community as to which one they wanted. Um, certainly that's not the only thing that we considered. There were probably a couple dozen uh, factors swirling around which decision might be better for our community in the long run. Uh, and but I will say that our community, with a fairly significant majority, was spoke strongly to wanting to be with Montpelier as opposed to Northfield Williamstown in that merger. Um, the reasons why would I, we never did a survey, we never uh, polled everyone in the town. Um, but from that feedback, uh, it was it was pretty resounding that the, the community wanted us to go with Montpelier, okay. um, and. Being a full partner in the in the merger study was also, I think, a, a big consideration. We had um, a, a full seat at the table, a full vote in the table, and uh, had we been with the Northfield Williamstown merger, um, one of the concerns at that point in the fall was we might become collateral damage in that merger if either Northfield or Williamstown voted no, and we were tacked on. We had no self determination in that and. Uh, that merger would have fallen apart and we would have been out in the cold. So we decided we wanted to take our fate in our own hands and 
in retrospect, uh, that merger passed resoundingly. So uh, perhaps our fears weren't um, well founded, but at the time we really didn't have that information and we, there was some uncertainty about it. Okay. And Tina, do you have a, any different take or anything you want to add to what you looked at and considered during your work on the study committee? As far as what we looked at and considered, no. I think we had a lot of discussions about equity, and it's a small place, Roxbury, and how would their students equitably be able to access the things in Montpelier? And I think the committee did a good job in that, uh, in looking at various data pertaining to that. So they might not be able to uh, take part in some extracurricular activities and such because of being so far away? Is that what you mean by equity? or? That's one thing. So for example, we put in the plan a late bus so that mm -hmm. you could stay here and be part of the activities and yet get back home. So it wouldn't be just up to your family to uh, make sure that you could be here. OK, great. Next question is the big one, really. Um, voters go to the polls next week. How would you, why, why should they vote yes or no based on your own personal perspective? I mean to start with that or are you? Oh, I can, I can we go don't ahead. have I, to go in order. <laughs> <laughs> I think for some of the reasons I articulated earlier, I really see for Montpelier residents there's the benefit of increased enrollment and increased stabilization. I just feel that from a budget perspective and a long-term perspective, saying no to 86 more students, especially when we saw the, the difficulties we had a few years ago, I, I just, I, I think that's a mistake to do that. Uh, I think Roxbury will be a good partner. I think that adding Roxbury to our school will enrich our school district. Uh, and there's a small tax savings. And I guess the kind of fourth piece is, uh, well, I'll add a fourth and a fifth. Uh, the fourth is that Montpelier will continue to be in control of the, of the district, as you said at the introduction. Uh, we'll have seven members of the board, 14 of 16 votes. Uh, I think Roxbury will definitely have a voice, and they're going to have two members, and their concerns will be listened to. But as a, Rox or as a Montpelier resident, you're going to know that, that Montpelier is still going to make most of the major decisions and be, be in a position to ensure that decisions are made in a way that continues to help all students and help you know, Montpelier and Montpelier's interests. Uh, and the fourth is there's really no downside. And, I, and that's kind of been one of the things I've been hearing from people, well, you know, what's, what are the costs, what are the cons? And as someone who came into this kind of skeptical, kind of wondering why Roxbury, uh, why does this make sense? I'm, yeah, I'm open to hearing, but I certainly didn't come in with a bent towards needing to do this. Uh, and hearing the pros and cons over several months and several meetings and several hours, uh, there are clear upsides and there really isn't a downside. There's not a hidden cost or a, a, you know, unintended consequence, and I think we look pretty thoroughly at that. So you've got, you've got you know, identifiable upsides and no real identifiable downsides. So I think it's a pretty clear choice. Tina, do you feel the same way? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I have said from the beginning that um, I see no significant upside for Montpelier. And I, on the other hand, I quickly follow that by saying I have no data to prove a significant downside for Montpelier. Here are my concerns. And I'd say that both financially and educationally. So because of the small number of students in Roxbury, maybe an average of one student per classroom will gain in Montpelier on any given year. And my other concern is that I was principal of a small school. Now my small school was easily three times as big, if not bigger, than Roxbury. But small schools are expensive to run. And I'm feeling like after three years or four years, this new board will be in a position of considering whether to close the Roxbury School. Now, maybe Roxbury will gain a lot of students during the next few years, but K through four, there'll be 25 students in that building um, when, once the merger begins. And most schools across the state who have had 30 students or less have closed because of the financial burden. So it's something 
We can't quite figure. It's too far in the future to figure, but I guess I'd say I have concerns. You have concerns that that board, the unified board, would have to close Roxbury School. Do you think Roxbury School might have to close if you don't merge, John? It's a good Ooh. question. Um, uh, the future of our district uh, in its current format is not sustainable. So I can say that. Uh, prior to Act 46 being passed several years ago, our board was uh, about to try to find a new solution for how things were being run there. Um, we clearly had identified some problems, uh, had identified that we were on an unsustainable path. And uh, as soon as Act 46 was passed, however, we really had to focus our energies on that, and that's taken up the last two years on the school board there. So um, it's, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that when anyone is looking at educating young children up through grades two, three, four, um, certainly travel logistics and the best place to, to educate those children is something that any district is going to look at. Um, I would disagree with Tina on several things. I think she's conflating um, small schools closing in a different environment um, as opposed to being part of a larger district um, or potentially being part of a supervisory union. Um, which we currently are. As, as one district, uh, we, it's simply a building within the district. And how that building is used, how it is staffed, that is a district decision, just like figuring out which teachers are going to go to Union Elementary or uh, do we need someone over in the middle school. It, it, I don't know exactly if that's how uh, staffing decisions are made in Montpelier, but in other districts, uh, figuring out who's where is a district decision. So um, certainly there is the risk of that. However, I think as Jim pointed out, we built into the model uh, a staffing model that makes that school function indefinitely into the future, certainly with the number of students that are there and could, could absorb significant increases without any more staffing there. Um, the question has been increases raised. Increases in students. Correct. So there would be, it would be unlikely that it would cost any more to run that, that uh, staffing in that building, uh, and particularly even if 10, 15, even 20 new students moved into the town. Um, on the flip side of that, we certainly as a committee talked about uh, and raised the question, and we've heard it from committee members, about what happens if it becomes unsustainable? What happens if the population drops? Um, we pulled in uh, the last 20 years of data for the Roxbury Village School, and while it hasn't been exactly flat, I think within a, a fairly small deviation, it's been more or less stable for the last 20 years, and there's no data to support or, or to say that um, we would drop to a point where there's 10 kids in that building. And I've made the point in several forums that at that point, um, and my kids go there, so this is I have a vested interest of of uh, you know what my children's education would be. Um, I, I have no doubt that a future school board will make the right choice based on educational uh, principles and standards, as opposed to well, there's you know four or less kids in that building right now. Maybe we ought to close it down because we could save a hundred thousand dollars. That's generally not what school boards do. Um, so, uh, am I concerned about the future of our school? Sure. And that's one of the reasons why we chose Montpelier because in our conversations we felt that they were a great educational partner and people that valued education the similar way that we did in Roxbury. Yeah, can I just add a couple sure. things to that? I mean, kind uh, of going on what John said. I think, you know, we did use numbers that kind of, because we had those concerns. What does it take to run the school? Uh, we looked at increased staffing. You know, we did look at, at the kind of enrollment numbers, which have been stable. Uh, certainly, my desire is to keep that to have a structure that keeps that school open for the the pre K through four, uh, hopefully, you know, forever, because I think that's the best the best educational solution for those kids. And I think those expenses were built in, and again, those expenses still resulted in a major savings for Roxbury, a modest savings for Montpelier. Uh, 
you know, if everybody decides to vacate Roxbury in the next several years, I think that's a decision that the, you know, the future school board will have to visit. I think the chances of that happening are pretty low, both because there's no signs that people are vacating Roxbury. And I actually think there's a chance, just given the fact that I think Montpelier is a, an attractive school district, which we're seeing from uh, the fact it's one of the few school districts with growing numbers, that this adds a uh, more affordable uh, rural option for people who want to be part of that district to move into. So I, I think there's a chance that if anything, Roxbury could bring more students to the district and more students to that school. Probably not a ton, but perhaps a few more families. And I actually know some families in their early 30s that are kind of watching this merger and, and seeing where they want to move based on it, and Roxbury could become an option. Those anecdotal stories yeah. have filtered in to some members of Montpelier, certainly some members in Roxbury. That's why I mentioned that <clears throat> the school could handle even more students with the current staffing level that's budgeted in there. All right, so it might become a real estate boon for Roxbury. <laughs> <laughs> it might be over-exaggerating it a little bit, but it certainly, uh, I think, will help. Okay, if your communities vote no, mm -hmm. what will the impact be on your students? And it'll be different answers, I know, so. So, from, the first thing to, to think about is, uh, there's a 30-day waiting period after the vote. So uh, typically, if it's a resounding yes or no, that just kind of sort of passes. But if it's a close vote, it's an opportunity for people to assemble a petition for a revote um, at that point. So immediately, that would be the, the first, first thing to consider once the vote happens. Um, from uh, you guys will have to speak to the Montpelier uh, in terms of the impact on the students, but Montpelier is not required to do anything based on the current situation under Act 46 and the recent exemption that was placed into the Ed Bill at the end of the session this year. Uh, Roxbury is not so. The exemption being that if you have 900 students, correct. you do mm -hmm. not have to merge. Correct, um, and. So Roxbury will be faced with uh, a difficult situation for sure. Um, we have several choices or options in terms of action or non-action. One of them would be to wait and be placed by the state in the uh, state plan that will begin to be formed this fall and delivered next June, I believe. Um, in which case the state would decide to place us with someone as a district within a supervisory union. One of the unique situations that's going on right now is uh, within Act 46, if you've merged as a district, you can't be forced to merge within another district if you're um, within there and everyone around us has merged. So uh, technically, if I have my facts correct, the state can't force us to merge or force a district to absorb us as a district. Um, but they could place us within a supervisory union and the two closest ones would be the Northfield Williamstown uh, slash Orange Washington Supervisory Union or down towards Randolph. Um, those would be the two directions my guess is they would look and those would be the two directions that we will probably uh, have to reach out to if the vote is a no vote. And so the impact on the kids, uh, next year regardless of what the vote is, uh, both districts function as is mm -hmm. for next year. And again, as you mentioned, it would be 2018, uh, the fall of 2018 would be the first school year. We would, um, so we would probably have, uh, assuming the state made good on some of the guidelines in, in Act 46, we would begin to lose some of the things that keep our tax rate from skyrocketing. It already is going that way. So I would assume that uh, we'd have a very difficult uh, subsequent financial budget year, um, which, I, there is nothing to cut in Roxbury. We did that five years ago, and uh, I'm not sure what we would do. There could be some negative impacts. I don't think the school would, or the board would look at closing the school to tuition them because then we'd just be disrupting families even more. Um, but it might lend itself to a very unpleasant tax year until we were able to at least begin the process of of merging in there. And the children's education would probably be bare minimum as far as the programming? There's nothing to cut. <laughs> so so we'd be in a very tight spot um, and, and we were going to be in that regardless of who we chose. 
uh, to, to work with, but uh, there's really, we have two teachers teaching grades, I mean, sorry, three teachers teaching grades K through six in our school. So um, you can't cut a teacher out of that mix. <laughs> okay. And uh, there's not a whole lot of other places to cut. So. Okay. And in Montpelier, would students be impacted in any way? Well, the, as you pointed out, the revision to the law says that we're exempt from having to merge with anybody. Right. And I think um, student-wise, what's interesting in Montpelier, as Jim mentioned, we're already growing. So mm -hmm. kindergarten, first, second grade, we're growing our population, and that population is coming into the middle and the high school. So sort of on our own, we're growing student-wise. So I'm, I'm not sure of any great, uh, unlike Roxbury, I certainly understand the situation that Roxbury's in, but I'm not sure it will have a significant effect on Montpelier. Yeah, I'm certainly not going to say that if, if Montpelier votes us down, it's going to be catastrophic for the students or for the town. Right. Uh, I think the, the biggest loss is it's, it's a lost opportunity to shore up those numbers longer term. Uh, I think Tina's right. I think over the next few years, uh, you know, we do have good numbers, and those numbers appear to be uh, pretty solid, at least for the next few years. Uh, you know, five, six years down the road, if those numbers drop again, uh, are we going to regret not having those 80 students from Roxbury? My guess is, is yes, uh, because I'm not sure where else we're going to find them. Uh, I think that's, that's the biggest downside. I think the other downside is this is really, I think, just a chance for, uh, I know one of the things I hear as a school board member is Montpelier really values diversity, uh, really wants you know our kids exposed to kids with, with different experiences growing up. I think this is a chance to do that, to bring some kids into uh, the school system that, that have different experiences growing up, that, you know, live on, on places where they, you know, sugar and have cows and Etc. I mean, not that kids in Montpelier are too too far from that, but there's not a lot of people you know, actually in Montpelier who who grow up uh, in those type of, of of circumstances. So I think those are kind of the the two biggest downsides. Okay, and we're almost out of time, but I want to quickly ask about how it will uh, impact if voters say no. How it will impact the taxpayer in each of your communities. Uh, certainly in Roxbury, uh, it's unknown, but we know that the tax projections are on an upward trend. So I can fairly confidently say that uh, your, the taxes for a Roxbury resident will go up, at least in the short term, until we sort out our new partner uh, in some capacity. Okay. And in Montpelier? Uh, there will be a, a s small... Uh, loss of an opportunity to reduce taxes some. Uh, I think the bigger impact, again, might be five, six years down the road. If our enrollment numbers start to, to drop again, uh, then I th we might find ourselves back where we were three or four years ago, uh, trying to, to, to get the budgets we want without big tax hits. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and speaking to this issue. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for watching. I'm with The Digger. Thank you to my guests. And please go out and vote on June 20th.